this is the way walkie in it. So today's study that I want to share with you will act kind of as a pre emblem or preparation for the camp meetings, camp meeting studies. It's a basic study that I want to go through and it's about the methodology that we are using in the movement. Not only today, but what we've used since the inception from 1989. It's all about methodology. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this message, with the ideas and the concepts that we have. I'm hoping that most of you are. But if you're not, if you're new to this message, then I think the terms that I'm going to use, that I'm going to be talking about, won't be strange to you, the words or the ideas. But the extent to which we will apply these concepts may be concerning to some of you. We're going to look at the book, uh, we're going to look at some Bible passages this morning, but I really want to take this study from the book Christ Object Lessons. That's going to be where we take most of our thoughts from. But as I said, we will also study some verses from script, scripture. So what I want to do this morning is to talk about the subject of parables. Now I know that all of us understand what a parable is. To some degree, to some extent, the word parable isn't strange to us. Now I'm sure you all know that the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old and the New Testament. What some people may not be familiar with is that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. And when we read an English translation, a lot of that information is hidden from us. And it's not obvious to see that there are two languages that the Bible was written in. So when we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, even though the words themselves in English may be the same words, they have slightly different nuances. They mean slightly different things from the old to the new. They have different properties and or, um, or characteristics. Both languages are interesting. If I were to say the Greek language is a very precise language, I think that would be a fair representation. It's a much more useful language to interrogate interrogate, especially uh, when we go from the English and we try to understand what some of these words mean. So we're really going to begin our study here to try to understand what this word parable means. So before we go to Christ's object lessons, if you turn into your Bibles, we can go to any New Testament passage but what we'll do is we'll go to the first mention of the word parable in the New Testament. So if you go to the book of Matthew, this is the first time you're going to see the word parable used in the New Testament. The word itself is found 66 times in the Bible. In a couple of verses, it's mentioned twice, but its first usage is found in the book of Matthew. So if we turn there, I'm going to go to Matthew uh, 13. For most of us, this is a familiar passage. You heard all, you've all heard of Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sure you all know that some call it the Beatitudes. So there's a Sermon on the Mount, and, there's, and there is also what the Bible calls the Sermon by the Seaside. So there was a sermon on the mountain, and there's a sermon on the seaside by the sea. And chapter 13 in the book of Matthew is the sermon that's by the sea. It's the first time Jesus really begins to speak in parables to the people, to the masses. He has spoken a couple of parables before this, but this is the first major time that we're going to see him using parable teaching. When we think about parables, I think that most of us would perhaps be thinking about a shepherd taking care of his sheep. The shepherd has a hunt 
the shepherd has a hundred sheep, one of them is lost, and he leaves the 99, goes looking for that one sheep, and when he finds that sheep, he rejoices. It's a familiar parable that we are all aware of. And if I were to ask any of you, I'm sure we'd all be able to give an answer of what all those symbols represent. You have a wayward lamb that goes, that goes and does its own thing and gets lost and can't find its way back to the flock. You have a shepherd who's, who is looking after the sheep and somehow or another, he loses the little lamb. And when he realizes the mistake that he's made, he goes searching for that lamb because the lamb cannot recover itself. So if we were to have the discussion on what that parable means, I'm sure all of us would have an opinion. We could look at this parable in a lot of detail. Ellen White comments on this parable, and there are many Christian commentators who look at this parable. So if I were to ask you, what does that lamb represent? That lamb that care, carelessly left the flock, left the care of the shepherd and went away. What I want us to think about, if you're probably thinking or you thought you knew the answer, is to think that there's not just one answer to that question. So if we were to put, if we were to put the lamb, if we were to put the lamb to one idea, if I were to ask you who was that shepherd that went looking for that lamb, who was that shepherd? I'm guessing most of you would say it was Jesus. Is that correct? Most of you would say it was Jesus. So we are, so we so we're to say that this shepherd is Jesus. I'll put a symbol of a cross for Jesus. So now he's up at the board. And um, most people would say that shepherd is Christ. So there's your symbol. The cross equals Jesus, which is a fair response. It's a correct response. It's, it's, um, I put that correct. It's a correct answer. But what if I were to ask you, does Jesus ever live to make intercession for us, to care for us? Does he ever slumber and sleep? No, he's always attentive. Um, oh, no. Okay, no. Is he always attentive? Yes. Would he get distracted doing a project and not look after you? No. So if that's the case, and we look at the story, how is it that this shepherd allows one of his sheep and his only and it's only a lamb remember a shepherd understands how lambs behave how they operate that they're inattentive they easily make mistakes they can get themselves into trouble so they need a lot of help how is it that this shepherd allows one sheep this lamb to run away and do his own thing. Why is he not paying attention? And if you ever thought, have you, and if you ever thought about that, if we're going to say that this shepherd is Christ, how would Christ let one of his lambs run away and not pay attention? So as soon as you start thinking about, about it that way, maybe you can begin to question in your mind maybe this isn't christ maybe this shepherd is someone who sat back and had a little sleep during the afternoon and one of his sheep escaped and he wasn't paying attention he wakes up and realizes and realizes he's only got 99 so he wasn't paying attention so the question is, is that an accurate representation of this parable? Could we learn something about the parable from that perspective? And I would suggest yes. So this shepherd can be a symbol or a representative of Christ, but it can also be a symbol representation of a human, maybe you and I, maybe for a parent. And you've lost track of your child or 
you're a leader in a church and you haven't paid attention to one of the members of your church or one of the people in the congregation. So all I want to show us is that very often when we think about parables, we only think that there's one version of one way of one understanding how to interpret how to interpret what a parable means. So now that the shepherd is a symbol of Christ, but we could also see that it could be a symbol of us, someone in the leadership position, whether you are a parent or I have a role in the church that requires you to keep a watch care of the people. So we have a shepherd and we have a sheep. So this sheep, who is, who is this sheep a symbol of? The way I've just okay. given the story. So um, sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. But you know at the at the top where it says human, like um yeah, uh, that's too far. Uh, just a little up. Right there, where it's um, Christ. <laughs> oh, I have an um, M. I think that is so cute, though. I never even thought of that. You know, human, you know, as a, I don't know. Sorry. Okay, bro, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, where am I? Uh, okay, so, okay. Okay, I think I know where I'm at. So we have a, the shepherd. Yeah, I'm gonna start there. So we have the shepherd and we have a sheep. So this sheep, who is this sheep a symbol of? The way I've just given this story, the way most people understand this story is that this sheep is a person will say it's you this is how most people understand what the story is christ and you and i've given an alternate an alternative version of a human being someone in a lead in a leadership position so more often than not we take the story that this sheep that ran away is us we carelessly, we carelessly lost, lost track of who and what we were, and we wandered away. So if that's the case, these hundred sheep that were all together, what were they a symbol of? Because if this was Christ, and you are part of a flock, then you were under the watch care, under the security of Christ. So what would the flock of sheep represent? Most people would say it represents the church because the story would seem to fit. You're part of a church. And somehow or another, you lose your way and you wander off. And Christ or the leader is going to come and find you. But I want to give us an alternative but I want okay but I want to give us an alternative story of what this sheep or this clan would represent now not literally because we know that that number 100 is not a literal number I didn't know that <laughs> okay it's just a representation of a group of people or a group what is this sheep wasn't what if this sheep wasn't a representation of you but was a symbol of a representation of the earth if you ever thought about have you ever, if you ever thought about that christ was managing had supervision responsibility for a hundred planets all with beings on those planets and one of them got lost and when one of those planets were lost to the shepherd, and what did he do? He came down to earth and rescued this planet. And we all know how the great controversy works. The earth is going to be restored. And not only will it be restored, it will also be the residence of Christ the Father 
and all the redeemed. So this was just a small exercise to help us see that when we think of parables, the story of the version, versions that you've heard, which is correct. These groups of people who are in the church, Christ who's the shepherd, the overseers of the church, one of those members in the church through their own neglect wandered away into the world. And Christ being a good person that he is, didn't say, well, you're in the church. If you wanted to leave it, it's your problem if they were lost. No, he went and made a special effort to rescue this person, you, us. We could argue that it's not the church, it's the whole world that is a symbol of those hundred sheep and we were lost. And Christ came and rescued us and brought us into the church. We could argue that the shepherd isn't even Christ, it's a human being, some, human being, someone who has a position or responsibility, perhaps a parent, an elder in the church. We could argue that this sheep isn't even a human being, it's the whole planet that has been lost and gone wayward. Go back to the history of Genesis and how Adam and Eve chose to listen to listen and serve Satan rather than Christ for no good reason. And God could have left us to our own devices, le left humanity to its own devices, left the whole planet to wallow in sin. But he didn't. He came and rescued us. So when we look at any parable, what I want to suggest is that there are multiple ways to understand these stories. It's not just a single version, one story, one explanation that fits. These parables that we're giving, these parables that were given in, ex, in inspiration. Ellen White has written much commentary, much on parables. As a matter of fact, there's a whole book dedicated to it, which is Christ's object lesson. If you think about the name, Christ is going to give some lessons to us. It's called object lesson. It's another way of saying Christ's parable teaching. He wants to explain to us how things operate, the relationship between God and human, between human and human, between angels and human. It's all about relationship. That's what parables are there to teach us, how we're supposed to understand our relationships with the world in which we live. And the way these stories were created, the way they were written, they can be understood in a multiple facet way. There's not only one version and people struggle with that. Because if you see Ellen White's explanation of many of these parables, she gives a version of a perspective. And because she's a prophet and we, hopefully all of us, have an immense amount of confidence in her work. When she says this parable means this, what can we tend to think is that it's the only version that there is, the only explanation of this parable? But what I want us to see is that that's not the case. Her perspective of what this parable means. These parables mean it's not only perspective of what they can teach us. We can do our own investigation, our own study to try to understand what these parables mean. People sometimes find that a dangerous endeavor. Some people might go as far as to say, well, if you come up with a different answer than the spirit of prophecy, does that mean you don't agree with the spirit of prophecy? Of course not. It doesn't mean that at all. Does it mean that the spirit of prophecy was wrong in its explanation of what these things mean? The obvious answer is no, the spirit of prophecy is not wrong. The question is, if we come, we, me, you, a group of people, come together to look up a parable and explain it in a different way than the conventional understanding, 
By conventional, I mean the spirit of prophecy, prophecy version. Does that mean we are throwing away the spirit of prophecy? No. Does that mean that we're teaching that we're teaching is wrong? And I want to say it's not. No. If we as a group of people, if we as individuals are not willing to expand and stretch our understanding of how to read parables, we're going to be confined to a very limited understanding of the great controversy of the world in which we live. If all we're going to do, if all we're going to do is take Ellen White's version of these parables, not only if we're only willing to take her explanation of the parable, but if we're only willing to understand parables in a narrow and limited fashion. So I want to speak about that as we go through our study and i'll explain what i mean by that so i want to begin to by saying or think of a loose definition it's my definition and i think it's an act and i think it's accurate of what a parable is its purpose the reason why we even talk about people parables <laughs> um so at its most basic and fundamental level, I want to say a parable, teach, a parable teaches us not about the natural world. The purpose of a parable is not to show us that the natural, what the natural world is like. We don't need a parable to do that because all, because all the, hmm, because all we know is how the parable world operates. Because we all know how the parable world operates. Let me fix that. Not snow, it's no. <laughs> okay. The purpose of a parable is, in fact, it teaches how the spiritual world works. This is the purpose of a parable, to show you or to teach us how the spiritual realm operates, how it functions, how it looks like, how it feels. Now, even though we're all spiritual beings, and I think that's an accurate representation of who we are, we were created in the image of God, both spiritually and physically, we're told. But essentially, we're spiritual beings that are encased or housed in a physical body. And if you're happy with that kind of concept, just a simple observation I think will show you that. If I were to ask you who you were, and I were to say, is this arm, is this arm, is this your arm? All you would say, all of you would say, yes, this arm is mine. If you look at your arm, but if that arm got chopped off in an accident and it lay there on the table, who would you be? You wouldn't certainly be the arm. You would still be the same person with the same thoughts, the same feelings, same emotions, same perspective, se separate or disconnected to your arm. And if you took that example further and further, you could chop off many parts of your body. Science now allows us to do that. You know, medically, we're able to keep people alive, even though they may lose many parts or they may become dysfunctional. And quickly you realize that actually we, if we could define who we were, we'd see that we're actually spiritual beings who live in this physical body. I appreciate that we have a connection between the spiritual and the physical, which is often not easy to explain or to understand. If I were to offer you two following Bible verses, as a person thinketh, so is he. When the Bible says, so is the person, what does that mean? It says, as he thinks so, he is. I want to suggest what that means. If we were to put it into plain English, a person behaves in the same way that he thinks, thinking you can't thinking you can't see, you can't touch, 
It's a spiritual, non-physical phenomenon, something that happens inside your brain. But as you think, you act out your thoughts. So that verse itself is the person thinketh, so they behave, so they are so are they, is by definition a parable. If you all know what a person thinks, this spiritual non-physical thought, how do you know how a person thinks? You see and feel and experience it how? Through the physical. Some people, perhaps, most of us are cheeky. <laughs> Some of us, perhaps, most of our are tricky. We lie, we cheat, we pretend to be something we're not. The Bible speaks about people like that as being hypocrites or actors. Now, you can fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Somewhere in your experience, the real you, the real spiritual thoughts come out. You can't hide behind the facade for very long you know how it is. None of you know me very well, but if I were to visit you and stay in your house, even for 24 hours, certainly by a week, you'd get to know me well, and I would get to know you. And very soon, it would be hard to pretend. It's not easy to keep up this pretense the closer you get to somebody. The Bible speaks about when someone who the bible speaks about when someone when two people get married what happens to them they become one flesh what does one flesh mean it means you know intimately what the part of the person it's natural okay the part of the person you know well the part of the person so they're natural you know how to think how to operate what's on the inside because you can see all the outside so as most basic level a parable is required or is a tool to understand the spiritual by seeing the natural so i've just given this explanation i used the bible verse to that i explained it at the level of a human being but most of us the way we would look at the parable I've just given here is to say, we want to know how heaven operates. How does heaven work? And how would we know how heaven works? We know how heaven works by seeing how nature works. I'll give an example. The way the Godhead in the most simplistic or basic fashion is explained is the father and the son now without getting into a complex doctrinal discussion on the relationship of the godhead i think most of us realize that there was not a real dad and there was not a real son it doesn't work that way because there wasn't a mother somewhere but however their relationship connects to each other it's going to be explained in terms that we can understand in terms we're familiar with because all of us are familiar with a parent and a child the father and the son so the relationship of the godhead is given in physical or natural terms so that we can have some ability to understand how heaven operates in heaven the angels are not all equal hopefully we all have an appreciation that we have different types of angels um seraphim cherubim we have archangels arc meaning the leader angel or the head angels we have the covering angels so we know that there is a hierarchy in heaven and we can and the way we can understand or get to know how that operates is to see here on earth we have hierarchical relationships we understand that the Father and the Son are kings. They sit on thrones in heaven. All of, the, all of that is explained in the natural term. So if you want to understand how heaven operates, the only way to do this is to see how it operates in nature. 
in the example that I gave. If you carelessly, through your own foolish behavior, or we could say deliberately, maliciously, wandered away out of the protection of the shepherd, what would you expect the shepherd to do? Would you expect him to say, tough luck, it's your fault, you got lost, you didn't need to? Is that what we would expect? How do we think Christ would respond to us? The way we know how Christ would respond is through this story, because we know that a shepherd wouldn't behave that way to one of his flock. It would go and make an effort to rescue it, even peril to the shepherd's own life. And what, and what that story is doing is showing us how heaven operates, how it really works in response to the natural world, in response to how the natural world operates. So this is a class, classic understanding or explanation of how parables operate what they mean. So let me summarize what we've said. The purpose of a parable is to understand the spiritual, spiritual, and the way you understand the spiritual is through the natural. In fact, it's the only way to do that. The only way you can understand the spiritual realm is through the natural realm, or we could call it the symbolic or the literal. So we'll put that down as well. So we've got literal things and we have symbolic things. We've made two points so far. The purpose of parables is purely to understand the spiritual, whether it's heaven, whether it's understanding another human being. And the only way you could do that is through the natural or the spiritual realm. That's why we need parables. The second thing we learn is that any given parable, the way it's constructed, the way it's written, it could be at different levels. And if we can appreciate that, what we can do is when we go into inspiration, we can see that we could study parables for ourselves and have an understanding which may not be the same understanding that you get in the spirit of prophecy. And that's not to say that the spirit of prophecy explanation is incorrect, but it shows us that we can understand in different ways. You're familiar with the parable of the woman. She lives in a house. And how many coins does she have? Ten coins. And she loses one of those coins. So if I were to ask you, what does the coin represent? we might have different answers. So if any of you wants to shout out what they may think a coin represents, and a uh, par meter waits for her, waits and then says, and then ask the audience says, you must have some idea. So my brother says, you. So if that represents you, who does the women represent? Some people are going to say the church. And then someone in the audience said um, a mother. Like a literal mother, Parmen asked. Okay, so a person. So if, so if this is the church and this is you, what does your house represent? And then someone gave an answer and he said, okay, but that home is literal. It needs, to it needs to represent something. So what I want us to see is that there are various ways to understand this parable. One suggestion that I would offer is that this house is actually the church. And this woman is someone who's in the church who has responsibility for 10 coins. And who in the church has responsibility for things? A leader. So there's this leader who loses one of these coins and the coins can't run away. So the full responsibility of losing the coin is upon this parable, 
this person's shoulder, excuse me. In this story, it wasn't the shepherd who lost the sheep. The sheep ran away of its own violation. But in this story, you don't have that luxury. The woman lost the coin. So already you can see that there are various ways to understand this parable. The coin doesn't know it's lost. The coin, does it know it's lost? No, it has no consciousness. So does that have a factor into this story? We would agree, yes. And when you begin to realize that, it begins to open a vast horizons of truth that would really change. Okay. Um, that would really change and reshape the way we think about our about how salvation works and the great sacrifice that God had had to make. Now you know if I can express it in a simple fashion, Christ leaves heaven, the spiritual being comes down to the earth and does what? He takes on our nature. However, you understand that not getting into the complexes of what that actually means. So Christ, the spiritual being, comes down to earth and takes the natural being, takes a physical body. He becomes like us. We explained already that he has to do that so that we can understand the spiritual. Now, if you... Now, if you were to go to the book of Genesis, and we would read that Adam knew his wife, what does that word knew his wife mean? It doesn't mean he got to know her well, does it? It doesn't mean he got to know her well, does it? What does the word knew his wife mean? It means that they had intimacy and they became one flesh we would we agree with that yeah that's what that word knew that's what that word knew so if we want to know the spiritual and we're going to explain the spiritual through the natural so here's christ the spiritual being he's going to come in human form so that we might what we might know his spiritual nature what does that teach you about what we become? How do we know about Christ's spiritual nature? Is it some forensic technical study that we're going to do, that we're going to read about Christ here on earth? So on earth, Christ was a nice person physically, so therefore that would teach us that his spiritual characteristic is that he's a nice person, so we all know that. Is that what we mean to understand the parable of Christ? The answer is no. The Bible teaches clearly that he took human flesh, this spiritual person, in order that we, who are physical, might be able to do what? That we might be partakers of his nature. When we partake his nature, what nature are we partaking? this one or this one we're taking the spiritual so this concept of parable teaching is fundamental to our understanding of how the gospel works it's not just some theoretical study that we might do about houses and coins about shepherds and sheep and we could get all the right answer and we can say, oh, we understand how to interpret and how to read the Bible. It goes beyond that. The reason why parables become so important to us is that they're the vehicle or the, the mechanism or what we could call the methodology behind, the say, behind being saved. And it's not just a theoretical technical study or con conversation that we can have. It's an experience that we must enter. So we must experience what a parable is or what we might call a living parable. We must become living parables. What does Paul call this? What does Paul call his disciples? If I can use it, 
he calls them my children. He doesn't say you're living parables. What does he say? You're a living epistle or letter. He says you're a living book. So he goes to a city. He gets these Gentiles who are all natural. He trains them to become what? He trains them to become spiritual. And then what, and then what you need to do is you need to go out and be this letter or an epistle and go teach somebody. Now we understand that. We understand that the Bible is good wood pulp. Oh, how's it go? We understand that the Bible is just wood pulp and ink. It doesn't really mean anything. It's only value, ha it only has value when, when the Bible, when does the Bible have value? When we live it. So you go to Jeremiah 31 or Hebrews 8, and the Bible speaks about there's going to be, there's going to come a time when I will put the law within your heart. Now, most of us, I don't mean particularly in this room, but most Christians, like the Jews, would take the word of God, and we don't want the Jews, lit and we don't, and we don't do what the Jews literally, literally do, put it on our arm and wrap it around our forearm and carry it around, or stick it on our forehead. We don't do that, do we? We don't do, and I don't know how to pronounce that word. Can anyone see it? Flattery. What's it mean? Uh, it's. I think that's the little box that Jews had uh, that they carried around their forehead to carry the law. The law was in. Oh, uh, okay. Could be wrong. Um, we don't do that like the Jews do. Did. Yeah. But we do similar things. We wear chains with a cross, so we have a picture in our house. Jesus or the Ten Commandments. We like these. We like these charts up on our wall. So we do very similar things. We have we have these rules and regulations, or the Word of God all around us. We surround ourselves with those with these words, and that's not a bad thing. It's a tool, a mechanism. It's a stepping stone. But that's not the purpose of inspiration. We all know that. It's so that we might be changed into the likeness of Christ. So there's three things that we've learned. Parables teach us about the spiritual realm. And the only way you can learn that is by looking at the natural. Parables can be understood in different ways. Christ himself was a parable. The spiritual being, God, had to take natural form so that, he could, so that we could understand him. And not only that, not only that we look at him and we say that's nice. The Bible says by beholding we become changed into the very likeness of Christ. So if we're going to be changed into his very likeness by looking at him, what does that looking mean? It doesn't just mean reading or studying his life. It's just like when two people become one flesh. And Adam knows his wife. He doesn't get to know her. They become one. One in experience. One in a relationship. That's that it's so intimate they become inseparable. So the purpose of a parable is not just to understand who Christ is. The spiritual being, by looking at the physical person, it's not just that. It's so that we can experience what it means to have humanity and divinity combined. If you can understand that, then you can understand why Christ if I can say it this way, is forced to remain in human form throughout eternity. We know that when he went to heaven, he retains his humanity, his human form, and he will retain it throughout eternity. He's forced to do that so that we can be one, so that he can be one with us. If he didn't do that, what would the problem be when we get to heaven? 
Let me try to explain how I would see this. Do we all agree that we need to stop doing sin? Yes. Uh, that we should be perfect? Sure. Without defining exactly what that means. So if I were to say without sin or perfection would mean gradu so if I were so if I were to say without sin or perfection would mean graduation, you finally arrive. Do we think that we have fully, completely arrived? We're going to be the ultimate human being when we get to heaven? No, I don't think we really do. We're still on a learning curve. We still have a lot more to learn about ourselves, about how we behave, how to treat one another. And that's just talking about us. Who are going to, who, that's just talking about us who are going to be part of the 144,000. What about the people three or four years? Um, what about the people three or four years ago who had some very strange ideas? You know, really strange ideas. What learning curve will they have to go through when they get to heaven? So if Christ took off humanity when he got to heaven, what would, be, what, what would the problem be for us? We'd have no learning. The learning would stop as soon as we get to heaven because we'd, we wouldn't know. How do we become more spiritual? Because we're not going to become more physical. We're already fully physical. We're all, hmm, that's a question. How do we become more spiritual? Because we're not going to become more physical. We're already fully physical. Our aim in life is to become more spiritual. So how would we learn to be more spiritual? We couldn't do that because we go to the Godhead. We go to the Father and Son, who was spiritual, and we'd say, teach us. And they wouldn't be able to teach us. They wouldn't be able to show us how to de develop further. Why? Because they're only spiritual. And the only way to explain what a spiritual experience is, is to show us through the physical. I don't understand the science behind that, but it's a fact. The only way we're going to understand God completely as we walk through eternity is by understanding Christ through his physical nature. He took on our nature so that we could partake his nature, and that will never cease. So I want us to see that. If you want to understand the spiritual, which we all do, we, want, we all want to be spiritual beings. And we could say spiritual beings mean good people. With the, whole, with, the only, with the only way to experience that or explain that is through the natural. Parables can be understood in different ways. We've spoken about Christ. Christ himself was a parable. And therefore, in agreement with Paul's instruction, what are we to be? To be parables. And the big problem that we face, and if we face this, all the people around us face, is that we're not good parables. Because what happens as soon as you open your mouth and you talk to your neighbor or your church brethren, what comes out? Does this come out? No. I don't know if that means that. Okay. Um, no, it's something, it's something bad that comes out. The way you behave, the look you the look in your face, the way you use your hands, all this is not a proper representation of of this. And I guess that's a difference between Christ when he came down on earth and us. And what our aim is, what God's aim is, for the natural and the spiritual to become one. So that we truly would be living epistles, not dead letters. So the purpose of, so, no, that's the purpose of parables. Now, parables are still a, are, are still a lot larger than this example that I've given. We're in Matthew chapter 13. Um, we're in verse 3. 
this is the first time the word parable is going to be used in the New Testament. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. We can learn many things if we're observant, if we're careful readers. So the first thing I want us to see is, or to observe, is that there are rules and a methodology behind studying. So the first thing I want us to see or to realize, if we want to understand about human beings, how we operate, how we think, where would we go? Where would be your first port of call? Would it be some random person in the 16th century? No. If you really want to understand how people operate, how they are con constructed, how they are put together, where do you go? You'd go to the book of Genesis. You'd go to the beginning. The first person, Adam. God created Adam, man and woman in his image. So if we want to understand human beings, we'd go to the beginning, the first mention or the first description of human beings. And that's a really important role that all of us use. Rule. That's a very important rule that all of us use. If you want to understand a journey, you go from A to B, from the beginning to the end. So if you're on a journey, what do you need to know about that journey? Where you begin and where you're headed to. And often, in fact, always, you're somewhere in the middle. So if, we want, so if you want to understand the path that we're going down, two things you need to know is, first of all, know the path you're taking. And the second thing is the beginning and the end. So I want to rephrase that in a following way. I want to use the idea of first mention, where the human being, where, where are human beings first mentioned? My brother says in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, that's the first place they were mentioned. Then we could say, where's the last place that they were mentioned? Now, when you think about the last place they're mentioned, that would be an interesting discussion because we could have different explanations about that. We could say, well, if the first place they mention is in Genesis, then the last place would be Revelation, the final work of God here on earth as he finishes up the great controversy. So we could go from Genesis to Revelation. Now, Revelation is the last book in the New Testament, and it's the last book in the bible there are 66 books in the bible how many in the old testament 39 and in the new 27 so we went to book number 27 in the old testament what book would you get to if you're not good at math or you don't have an index in your bible you can have a guess so there's 66 books, there's whatever that is, uh, 39, 27 in Daniel, and 27 Revelation. So go to the book of Daniel. Go to the book of Daniel. So Revelation is book number 27, and Daniel is book number 27. So that's just a little trick. That's the right way to explain it. There are much better ways to see this. But the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation Ellen White tells us is quite explicitly that they're essentially the same book. They deal with the same subject. And if you want to understand the book of, Re of Revelation, you really need to read the book of Daniel and vice versa. So I want to say the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are the same book. So we're going to talk about human beings as an example. Their beginning they're beginning the book of revelation that would be your start and you'd end in revelation with that where else could you end if you can end in revelation what other book could you end in daniel so you could put daniel or revelation 
if that's a, if you're okay with that. So all I want us to see is we can explain the beginning and the end in different ways. So I want to explain in another way now. When we start thinking about the beginning and the end. So the book of Genesis was the first book. And I'm going to call it Adam. It's the first man. Adam and Eve, a man. So if this was the first Adam, where would we go to talk about the last Adam? We've said we can go to the book of Revelation. We can also go to the book of Daniel. What other book could we go to talk about the last Adam? To the book of Matthew. We could go to the book of Matthew. So go to the let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All I want us to see is, is that what we're really doing is talking about parables. And we can see that we come up with different answers, different ways of explaining the same story. We're already got two books from the beginning to the end. Now we've got a third book, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is a really nice chapter. If you get a chance, try and read the whole chapter in its context. It's a really nice story, and there's many truths that, can, that, that we can get from this chapter, but we're just going to go to verse 45, just for this study. Now, before we read chapter 15, the whole point of this chapter, I don't know if you're subheading in your Bibles. If you do, if you went to the beginning of chapter 15, and if anybody's got one here in their Bible, what's the purpose of this chapter? In the resurrection of the dead, it's the resurrection of the dead. Different Bibles explain it, it, explain it different in many ways. It says that, hmm, that's, I don't know that maybe that's day of the resurrection. So I don't know, that's a typo. My apologies. Um, or some people's versions will call it the resurrection of the dead. So chapter 15 is about the resurrection. We're in verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So I'm not going to ask who the two Adams are, but we can see we've got a first and a last. Hopefully, hopefully we can see that. We've got the first Adam, We've got the last Adam. Can we all see that? It's the first Adam, and then it says the last Adam. So we have a first and we have a last. What I want us to see before we discuss who those Adams are, I'm sure we all know who they are. It is when he talks about the first Adam. He says, the first Adam was made a living soul. And then the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So we've got a living soul. So we've got a living soul. I'm going to write that here. I'm going to make a bit of a jump now. For those of us who are familiar with some of these rules or some of the techniques that we use in studying God's word, this will be familiar to you. Even though you may not um, have seen it in this verse, but that technique or that this or that will be, for, um, let me see, but that technique or that said will be familiar to you. For others, it may not be so familiar, but I think you'll all be able to see it when I explain it to you. If I were to say Revelation 8.13, no need to turn there. It talks about whoa, 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 three woes. I don't know what you're understanding of, what you're standing of understanding of those are. Here on the chart, it talks about the woes. It says the first woe, then the second woe, and then it says the second woe is past, and it gets a bit fuzzy, and he says the third woe. So you've got whoa, whoa, whoa. You've got three woes. This is taken from Revelation 18, 
in chapter nine. So if I were to say, whoa, 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 or if I were to say Revelation 14, verse 8, Babylon is fallen, you can say that you can say the text, the next bit is fallen. That would be a repeat. So everybody knows what repeats when you say the same thing. Why would the Bible repeat things? Different people have come up with different answers. We know that God doesn't does it. We know that God does it with his breath by repeating these things. There's a reason for it. I will suggest that there's a symbol or a purpose behind repeating, but I'm not talking about repeating per se. Now repeating is obvious. You say the same thing, fallen, fallen, whoa, whoa. You don't learn much. Now, if I were to say a word or a verb or an action, and then I were to say the same thing in a different, in a different, using different words, I repeated myself. But if I explain something, for instance, I said the person ran, we all know what running is. Then I said that person moved swiftly or the person moved with me. What have I done? What I've done is repeated myself, but I said it in a different way. So I expressed the same thought in a different way. So if you want to know what run is, I said the person ran away. And then I said that that person moved very, very quickly. What type of running is that? Was that a jog or was that a sprint? When I said he moved very, very quickly. Okay, it's a sprint. So I've given some description of what running looks like in its contents. So I repeated what I've said, run more quickly, but now I've enlarged upon it or I've explained it in more specific way what the running looks like. Looked like. So this is so this is a concept concept that we employ or we observe in our study of inspiration a lot. It's the concept of repeat and enlarge, which means the same thing, but you say it in a different way. Hopefully we know that we, hopefully we know that we can get that. So I'm just going to put it up there. I'm going to put repeat and enlarge, if you're okay with that. Is everybody familiar with William Miller's rules? Yes or at least we've heard all of them. There are 14 rules. I can't remember, I can't remember the rules. There's a lot of them and they're quite detailed, but there's two rules that I like. And if you heard that, if you heard that presentation that I've done on this subject, you'll know what my two numbers are. Rule number one and rule number five. The reason why I like them and why I think their significance is if we're going to the church, what are the two churches that are significant and important to us as God's people? So let me, before you answer it, ask the same question in a different way. So I've gone from William Miller's rules. There's 14 rules. I'm saying I like number one and I like number five. And we know that there are seven churches and 14 rules. There's a connection there. But if I like rule one and rule five, what churches would I like? Church one and five. The church of Ephesus is what history? The history of the early church or the history of Christ, the story of Christ. And the fifth church is what? Sardis which is the Millerite history. So the two dispensations that we focus most on, the story of Christ and the story of the Millerites, have a connection between the first and fifth church, which have a connection with the first and fifth rule. Maybe a bit crazy, but I like that. And the reason why I like the fifth rule, let me give a paraphrase of what the fifth, fifth rule is. I've got the Bible here, and if I had another book, here's my other book. This is a dictionary, not a, 
not in a real life. So if I want to explain what a word in the Bible means, how would I explain what the word means? More often than not, we go to the dictionary. And if the word said brethren, I wonder what brethren means. I go to a dictionary. It tells me what brethren means. It means brother or fellow human being or something like that or a church member. So we have a Bible and we have a dictionary and that's all good. We have lots of dictionaries. Most famous most famous dictionary that we that we all use probably is Strong's Lexicon because that's just a good dictionary. Dictionaries are good, but rule number 5 says try to avoid using dictionaries. It doesn't say it doesn't say it in that way. It says something like this. Let the Bible be its own expositor. And the concept of expositor means explainer. So let the Bible explain itself. That's what rule number five is. It could say, don't use a dictionary to explain a Bible word. What should you use? Use the Bible to explain a Bible word. That seems common sense at one level, but it's quite difficult to do. And often we're not very familiar with doing it. Although Adventists would say the same thing, rule number five, which is don't use a dictionary, let the Bible explain itself. The way we could use that concept, we would say proof text. The one Bible verse explains another Bible verse. So if you heard of the concept of, concept of proof text, that's rule number five. That becomes important, especially when you start looking at the Millerites. We're doing, uh, uh, let me see. That becomes important, especially when you start looking at what the Millerites were doing and how rule number five becomes significant for them. I want to say rule number five is the, is the rule here, repeat and enlarge. So what you're going to do is have a verse or a Bible word or a word in the Bible, and you're going to repeat that, which means proof texting, and you're going to enlarge upon it, which means you're going to explain that the original concept or the or what or the idea means. So number five, William Miller says the Bible will be its own explainer, its own expositor. Try to avoid dictionaries. There's nothing wrong with dictionaries. That's not the purpose of this discussion. You understand it mo you understand most and as most Adventists do by the concept of proof texting. I want to use this idea of repeat and enlarge, which means you say the same thing. That you don't say fallen and fallen, and you say run and move very quickly. You say the same thing, you say it in a different way with different words. Here's rule number five. This is rule number five. We're going to employ it now. If it's rule number five, what does rule number five mean? You've repeated something. And explain it and explain it in different ways, which means the Bible will explain itself. So if I were to ask you, what does the word live mean? Am I making too much noise? Okay, someone read for me for a minute. I'm going to go help my brother, okay? Okay. Someone there? Um, I'll stay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. So if I were to ask you, what does the word live mean? It says Adam was a living soul. What does the word live mean? So we are going to repeat the term, a life and the life. But the second time, we're not going to use the same word. Otherwise, you will all just be living, living. We're going to use a different word to explain the same concept. So we're going to use the word quickening. And the word quickening, if you look in its definition, means to be alive. 
So this is an example of William Miller's rule number five. It's repeating and enlarge. And you can see it in usage here. There's live soul, quickening spirit. That is a simple, most trivial example. But I think it's useful to see simple examples. So we can see that this technique, this methodology is used throughout the scriptures. So we've connected these two. If you've connected these two, what do you think you're going to do with the word soul? We're going to connect the word soul with the word spirit. So live soul, quickening spirit. Now in the Bible, it's not one size fits all. Soul, when you become a living soul, what do you become? A living person. It's not spirit. You become a living person. So I'm going to call this the natural. So the soul is the natural and the spirit is spiritual. Adam, the original Adam, was the first natural person. This last Adam, he was what? He was spiritual. So what you got here, you're going from the natural to the spiritual, which is the definition that we have for parable. So who's that first Adam? We know it's literal, literally Adam. Who is the last Adam? We know it's Christ. If you went to the context of the chapter, we could prove that. Did you want to go back into it? Um, I don't know where I'm at. We're at the top of page 24. Yeah, good. You're a quick reader. <laughs> okay, the top of, oh, but what? But we won't? Okay. Yep. Um, do you want to read? I can read for a while. It, unless yeah, I'm my eyes are kind of hurting, but yeah, just give me a break. Okay. But we won't do that. It is Christ. So you got Adam and Christ, and what is Christ? He's a spiritual being. Being. What was Adam? He was a physical being. So if you want to understand Christ, who do you need to look to? You need to look to Adam. So when it says to look to Christ, what Christ do you need to look to? Do you need to look to the spirit being? I'll do it in the shape of a cloud. Is that the Christ that you need to look to? No, that would not help you what it, with it. It would not help you with it. The Christ that you need to look to, the spiritual person, how does he look? He looks like this. He looks like a physical being. And I want to do a shape of a heart in this heart that he has is glorious and beautiful. He becomes a quickening spirit. And this model is the same as this model when you go back to see how Adam was created. And it was created identical to the last Adam. So the natural Adam and the spiritual Christ. Paul is a very interesting and capable writer. The more you read what he writes, the more you meditate upon his words. What you see is he uses these concepts of repeat and enlarge. Miller's fifth rule, parable teaching, beginning and the end, he uses these techniques over and over again, and he wraps them up in this convoluted and complex fashion and it's an interesting and profitable exercise to try to unpick them layer upon layer upon layer and to see how he wraps all these things up in a really simple phrase. I mean, this is a simple verse itself, but the way he constructs it is profound and educational. So what we've done is we've, um, is we've gone from the beginning to the end. And we've seen that we can explain it three ways, three different ways. The whole explanation is wrapped up in the whole model of parable teaching. So this is another example of how we can look at parables and see that they are all encompassing. We look at parables to understand the spiritual. You need to know the natural. You can understand parables in different ways. The same parable can be seen differently. 
It's a person, it's a doctrine, it's Christ. It's the human being. It's the whole of this planet. It's an individual. Then we look at the concept of first usage or first mention. The first time the word parable is mentioned is in Matthew 13. It becomes important when you start using this parable or any word, and we see the same concept being brought to view when we think about the first Adam and the last Adam. So if we're going to go to a verse where we said the first time that the word parable is used in the New Testament, what else could we do? What else should we do? The first time the word is used in the Old Testament. So then we can go to the Old Testament and see the first time it's used in the Old Testament, which in fact would be the first time that it's used in the whole Bible. Not only is it interesting, it's profoundly important to understand this rule of first mention. We know it must be important because if you want to understand what kind of a human being you are, what your destiny was, where you came from, what would you do? You would go to the first Adam and then you go to the last Adam. This is where you began your journey, isn't it? As a human being with the first Adam. And where would you and your and where would you end your journey going? By looking and pointing to the last Adam. Let me put that on a line. Here's the journey where, where did we start? With the first Adam. Where will we end? With the last Adam. So yeah, the first Adam and the last Adam. And we're Adam ourselves. Now, a human being, where are we? We're here on this journey. And if you want to get to the right place, you need to know where you came from and where you're going. And you need to understand both. And what have we learned? What did the first Adam look like? He was a natural person that was spiritually inside. And what was the last person? He was a spiritual person that had a physical body. So these people are the same the beginning and the end. Now often we employ the Greek alphabet because we like doing fancy things. And instead of saying A to Z in the English, what do we say? And I say we because we like doing crazy things. It's not even just us. Even Christ speaks about himself in this way. So often we think about this idea of the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And what does, what has this taught us? What we've, what have we seen so far? What's the difference between the first Adam and the last Adam? The Alpha and the Omega with the difference between them? No difference. They are the same. So if they're the same and you begin your journey here at the beginning and you end your journey here at the end, you begin and you end where? At the same place. You begin with the human being that was created perfect, beautiful inside, because he was created in the image of his maker. And where, you, where do you and your journey end? At the same place. How do you begin and end your journey at the same place? What would that look like? Because often we draw straight lines, it's a circle. You end up going around in a circle. So if you, ever thought what I keep on doing is going around in circles. It's not getting anywhere. It's actually not that bad because that's where you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. And that becomes interesting, especially when you go to the book of Ezekiel, because in the book of Ezekiel, you know that when Ezekiel has his vision of this, I don't know how to describe it, this great mach machine or vehicle or chariot, it, it is all wheels within wheels. You know, almost like you have the angels turning these cogs around. It all looks like this complicated mess, but it all makes sense. And those wheels we would teach, we would defend that those wheels are they're, um, they're repeating, they're repeating stories that occur over and over again. And they occur over and over again because they're actually these lines of history 
that we need to journey along from the beginning to the end. And you end your journey where you started your journey. And it's all contingent on the concept or the idea of parable teaching. Now I spoke about the first mention, where in Matthew chapter 13, verse three, and what I want us to see is that Jesus speaks of them in parables. And it's the first time parables are mentioned in the New Testament. And what's the story about? It's about a sower who went forth to sow. And all I want to pick up there that this first time parables are mentioned, what's, what's it connected to? What's the subject? It's connected to the subject of agriculture. And the subject of agriculture or the story, the story or the storyline of agriculture becomes important for us to understand. You see it used throughout scripture to explain heavenly or spiritual things. And it becomes so important, this concept of agriculture, when we think about the everlasting gospel. If I were to talk to you about the ever of the everlasting gospel, where would you go? Which book would you go to? Would you go to the book of Revelation? You go to chapter 14. You go to verses 6 and 7. There was an angel flying in the next heaven, and the next of heaven have been what? The everlasting gospel. And this angel, Revelation verse 6 and 7, is connected to a second angel, verse 8 connected to a third angel, verse 9. She had these three angels given these messages, which is the everlasting gospel. And after these three angels have done their work, if you read through the rest of the chapter, Revelation 14, all about the everlasting gospel, I've, I'll just show you on, these on this chart here. So here they are, the first, second, and third angels' messages. This is Revelation 14. After those three angels are done, the storyline has been given. Then the rest of the verse, depending on how you go, you pick up from around verse 3.1, or yeah, I'm sorry, around verse 13. I would suggest from verse 13, the story changes and you see other angels. But what I want us to see when, we, when it talks about those other angels, just from the pictorial work, it's a bit hard to see the back. But you'll see that there's Christ and there's another angel. There are two beings from heaven and both of them have got a sickle in their hands and a sickle is an instrument of harvest. One is going to do good a good harvest and one is going to do a bad harvest if i can say that it that way so the everlasting gospel is intertwined with the whole concept of agriculture it's right it's found right there in revelation chapter 14 you can't separate the everlasting gospel from the model of agriculture it's important for us to understand how agriculture works and what it means to us the symbology of it and you can see that right here when you talk about parables. The first parable that are the first parable that are given are connected to the agricultural model. Now, what's interesting in Matthew 13 is that this agricultural model is going to be given in different ways. It's not just one parable about the agricultural model, it's given different ways, and perhaps the most important famous of all those parables begins in Matthew 20. Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30, and that's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Two groups, two groups, the wheat and the tares, and that's directly connected to this subject here, the wheat and the tares. Two groups are going to be harvested. Why is that important? Because if you go to Matthew 13, and we are to look at this parable. First, you've got the parable, verses 24 to 30. And then later, Christ is going to explain this. If you go the first, if you go to the first 36, everyone's left. 
they've gone back to someone else's um, someone's house and the disciples are going to say this then jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and the disciples came unto him saying declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field can you explain what this parable means and the thing and the first thing jesus is going to say verse 37 he answered and said unto them he that sows the good seed is the son of man the field is the world so straight away he's going to tell this is a story about what the world the planet earth so the parable of matthew 13 the wheat and the tares are a story about the whole world that's christ's explanation of what this parable means christ himself is going to explain this now what we could do is we could go to the spirit of prophecy and we can ask ellen white what she thinks this parable is about and i want to suggest in fact not suggest that we're going to read it is that when she looks at this parable she's going to explain it in a different way she's not going to say that this field that the wheat that the wheat and tares are growing is a symbol of the world this is taken from christ object lessons page 70 paragraph 2. the field christ said is the world matthew 38 uh, 1338 we read that quoting from um, sister white that we must understand this field as signifying the church of christ in the world so christ says the field is the earth the spirit of prophecy says it's the church we've got two different answers to the same parable i want us to see that becomes significant Christ tells you that this is a story about the earth. And Ellen White says, no. She says, when we then you need to discuss who the we are, we must understand this as signifying the church that's in the world, not of the world, probably. Um, we don't have time to discuss this. One way to think about it is she is correcting christ is she telling you that what christ meant was when he said the world he didn't mean the world he meant the church but is but it is just said world that she now is going to correct him nearly two thousand years after these words were penned does she mean that or does she mean that christ meant the world but I want us to understand it to mean something different. I would argue later that Christ wants to make one point and Ellen White wants to make another point. If that's the case, which point is the correct one? Christ or the church? And someone said both. If, so if it's both, we wouldn't know who that we, um, who is she speaking to when she says we? So if we were to assume, we don't have time to study this, that she's talking to us, Seventh-day Adventists. You want me to finish? Sure. Okay. Um, so if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you want to read Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30, when you read the field, what are you supposed to be thinking world or church must be the church so is the church so is the church what church hmm. what church is is she speaking about when she says the church that's in the world she will explain that that means there's only ever been one church it go it goes um to seven dispensations ephesus laodicea laodicea but there's only one church and if one church is going through all these experiences when she says we she's talking she's talking to the audience that is alive then 
Which church is she referring to? Which dispensation? Seventh-day Adventist church, which is the church of Laodicea. So what is she wanting us to understand? That sometime in the experience of Laodicea, there's going to be a harvest. And there's going to be two groups, wheat and tares, that are growing together in the Seventh-day Adventist church, which needs to be separated. That's all good and well, but is that what Christ wanted us to understand? No. Christ wanted us to understand something different. He wanted us to understand that on earth, there are two groups. There are two groups on planet earth, and that's a completely different dynamic. Just like the coin is, you or the doctrine. This shepherd is a human being or Christ. There are completely different dynamics going on. So if you can begin to open up our own understanding of how parables operates, what we, what we can begin to do is understand what God wants us to learn here at the end of the world. He has a specific message for us. And if we're going to limit ourselves to a specific definition or explanation of what parables mean, like one size fits all, we're going to be limited in our understanding. I'm giving you a number of examples how that works. So I want to summarize what we've learned today. The purpose of parables is only to understand the spiritual, but you can't understand the spiritual realm or the spiritual kingdom. To understand it, you have to go to the literal or the natural. That's what parables are designed to do. Parables can be understood in different ways. Christ explains it to be the planet Earth. Ellen White says, no, we need to understand it as being the church. We've given you the story of who the shepherd is, who the sheep is, um, given an explanation of who the woman is, who the coin is. Then we spoke about parables and where, and where they are mentioned. The first time the word parable is mentioned in the New Testament is Matthew 13, verse 3. The first time it's mentioned in the Old Testament. I didn't give you the verse, it's number 23, verse 7, and that becomes significant. And, and at the camp meeting, um, we, we, we were going to continue this discussion. Oh, and at the camp meeting, we're going to continue this discussion and explain why that becomes so significant to us, number chap, numbers chapter 23 and verse 7. For those of you who are not familiar with that number 23, it's about the backdrops. It's about the backdrop, that story. The story is of Balaam. We've heard, we all heard of Balaam, the prophet from the East. This Balaam story, when he's going to curse Israel, the first time you hear the word parable in the Old Testament, in fact, in the Bible, is, is why Balaam used you um, why Balaam tried to curse God's people. And that becomes significant reference point for us to understand. We look at the first usage of the word parable in the New Testament. When it's used in the New Testament, it's connected to the subject of agriculture. Agriculture is connected to the everlasting gospel in Revelation 14. So we know that parables are connected to agriculture agriculture is connected to the everlasting gospel therefore therefore parables by definition are connected to the everlasting gospel gospel we show that in different ways christ had to come to the earth to explain what the, a spiritual being is he had to take a, on human form not that we could understand the spiritual through looking though looking at this physical person but we could know him, know he means experience. So we have to experience spiritually. So we have to experience spiritually because he experienced his natural or a physical nature. So we swapped with him. We gave to him or he takes upon himself our physical nature. And what does he offer us? A spiritual nature. It's all about parable teaching. 
when we look at the rules of first mention, the role of first mention is important. The role of first mention deals about when to look at a subject. It's the first time ever discussed. I introduced a subject by talking about Adam, a human being. A first time, the first time a human being is mentioned is in the book of Genesis. The last time human beings are mentioned is in the book of Revelation. But Revelation and Daniel are the same book. So you could go to Revelation or Daniel. We also found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about the few first human being and the last human being. The first Adam and the last Adam, and it talks about them in different ways. He was a living physical person. He was a living spiritual person. And what we hear is the usage of William Miller's rules. The ones I like are number one and rule number five, which correspond to the first and fifth church. Rule number five says, try to avoid dictionaries. Let the Bible define itself. Adventists call that proof texting. I call it repeat and enlarge. The Bible repeats a concept or an idea. And when it repeats it, it will say it in a different way. So living, so living becomes quickening. This, then the same concept is repeated but it's explained in a different way. This rule number five, repeat and enlarge, when you can connect it that way, then you can connect a soul and a spirit. And what you see is that there is a natural and the spiritual, which is the very definition of a parable teaching. There's a lot more in that verse that we could package because it talks about a quickening spirit and that concept of the last Adam being a quickening spirit is not only that he was a spirit, that he was a lie, it's that he has the ability to give you life. That either of him being a quickening spirit means that he gives you the ability to have life. How does he do that? He does, how does he offer his life to you? We know that he does that through the cross. He died for us. But it's the exchange which is all connected to this idea, parable teaching. He takes something from us and he gives something to us. There's this exchange. And if there is this exchange, Christ and us become the same thing, which means we become one flesh. We become indistinct distinctionable from Christ because if we look at Christ what would we see a human being because it looks special no it looks like a normal human being but on the inside it's pure and good and clean and what's his ideal for us the same thing we are human beings and we are going to be given a new heart where the law can be written upon so we take this idea about the first Adam and the last Adam, and we've now put it upon a line. We call it the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We're not at the beginning of our journey. We are certainly not at the end. We're somewhere in the middle. So if you want to reach your journey's end, you need to be put on the path. If you're on the path, you need to know where you begin. We begin our story at the first Adam, and we're going to end it with the last Adam. And in the middle, we're in a bit of a mess, as we all know. The first Adam and the last Adam took the same because this Adam was created in the image of God. So if you begin your journey at the same point, it becomes a circular argument. And in fact, you go, you never go anywhere. This is the story of Ezekiel and the vision that he had in the imagery of the wheel within the wheel. This is, this, it, this, these, let me see, this is these um, repeating patterns that the Bible speaks about over and over again. The church that we can focus on in our studies are the church of Ephesus, 
number one, in the church and the church of Sardis, number five. Rule number one, rule number five. They become important rules for us to understand in a really in a really clear way. So this was just a brief introduction to parable teaching. For those of us who are familiar with these things, I hope it was a pleasant refresher. For those of us who are not so familiar with these things, I hope it serves as a gentle introduction to the methodology that each of us needs to become familiar with in order to understand not only end time prophecy, but also to understand their own experience, the relationship that God wants us to have with us, and how it's achieved. How the story of Christ comes from heaven to earth is the story of how we come from earth and get to heaven. It's all through this theory, this concept of parable teaching. The end. Amen. Good job. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. Sorry for the typos. Don't worry about that. It's all good. Mm -hmm. it, it was a good refresher on parable teaching, like you said. That's good. Yeah. And I learned a couple other things in there, too. It was good. Well, it helps me. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, it's about 820. Does anybody have any other thoughts or anything to say? Okay. Um, shall we say prayer then? Pray. Okay. Holy Heavenly Father, Lord God, happy Sabbath. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for being in our presence. We thank you for your angels who surround us. Father, we want to come before you and give you so much thanks for bringing us all together, for bringing the unity into this movement, for um, allowing us to see our condition, for giving us the promises, and also, Father, for giving us the lines which... Um, lead us to where we are going to go father we pray that you will enter into our hearts and that our hearts will be full of you that whatever you say or have us do we will do that we know that you are the end from the beginning father and that we are your servants your messengers and your priests so we come before you father and we ask for your help and your direction and we give you thanks we love you so very much in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Tony. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to go tend to my brother, so I will see you all Sabbath morning. Yeah. Love you all. See you tomorrow. Okay. Night. Bye bye. Happy see you Sabbath. Good night, everyone. Good night. 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 Good night.